Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Kai Sobiada, and I have the honor uh, to talk with Dr. Paul Gold and apol on apologetics and the brilliance of the gospel. Uh, Dr. Gold is Associate Professor of Philosophy of Religion and the Director of Master of Arts in Philosophy of Religion at Palm Beach Atlantic University. In addition, he is the founder and president of uh, Two Task Institute, uh, and the past visiting fellow at Henry Center for Theological Understanding at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Uh, Dr. Gold has a master in philosophy of religion and ethics from Talbot School of Theology and a PhD in philosophy from, from Purdue University. He is the author uh, or editor of 10 scholarly and popular level books, including cultural apologetics, philosophy, a Christian introduction, and the story of the cosmos. Well, welcome to the program, Dr. Gold. Thank you. It's great to be here with you. So um, for this uh, interview, I decided to use a book uh, that you co-author with uh, Travis Dickinson and Keith Lofton, uh, Stand Firm, Apologetics, and the Brilliance of the Gospel. Well, it's a captivating book that needs to be read by any student in apologetics and anyone else interested in apologetics, defending the faith. Uh, my first question is, why did you wrote this book? What circumstances propel to, uh, the willingness to write this book with Travis and Kate? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, part of it's just you, you like to do fun things with your friends. And I guess writing a book is somewhat fun, at least when you do it together. But beyond that, uh, both all, all three of us uh, at one point taught at the same institution. We're teaching in a seminary uh, in Texas, in the United States, and we were teaching apologetics. And we wanted something that would be accessible, or that that um, someone that has no exposure to apologetics, no exposure to a, uh, philosophy, could understand. And so we did our best to try to write a book that would uh, serve the, that kind of student that needs an introduction. That's that's easy to follow, but takes them into the main contours of the kinds of discussions that you have uh, in apologetics. So that was kind of our heart behind it. <laughs> so going back to the apologetics, and uh, my question is, you know, why does apologetics matter? There's a lot of confusion about apologetics. Some people, they think that to apologize to something. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about the defending of the faith, why it matter? From, for whom and why? You yeah, know, that's great. So... Traditionally, how the the it's actually a subdiscipline of theology. Maybe you could think of apologetics, but it's it's traditionally understood as something like the rational defense of the Christian faith. I actually don't have the that that's uh, that's not my view. I think of apologetics a little broader than that. That we we want to defend not just the rationality of Christian faith, but we also want to defend the desirability of Christian faith. And so we wanted to, uh, so, you know, there's this passage in the Bible in 1 Peter 3.15, where uh, Peter writes that, you know, all of us should be prepared to give the reason, the apologia in the Greek, the reason for the hope that we have within. And I think we're just convinced that Jesus and the gospel and Christianity are not just true to the way the world is, that's the reasonableness part, but it's also true to the way the world ought to be. That's the, that's the desirability part, right? That it satisfies the deep longings of the human heart for meaning and purpose and happiness and identity and things like that. And so apologetics is super important for at least two audiences, two, two kinds of people. Uh, for those that don't, that are looking from the outside at Christianity, wondering if it's true. Um, so for the non-believer, the, those who haven't yet, um, come to you know, believe that Christianity is the true and desirable religion. And of course, we want to commend the faith of Jesus Christ to, to those people. And we want to do that in a way that's respectful and loving uh, and, and all of those things. But the second audience that uh, is important for apologetics are believers, those who actually do ha and have come to faith in Christ. Because the reality is there's objections that are that are always leveled toward Christianity, and there's doubts that we struggle with as just human beings. And so apologetics is actually helpful for strengthening us in our own faith, because we realize, and this is what I would say to any student as I teach, especially younger students, is that there's nothing that you're going to learn in your classes that somehow Christianity can't handle. But that doesn't mean that there's not real hard questions. And so, yeah, those are the two audiences. Um, but it's basically showing the, the, the brilliance and the beauty of Jesus and the gospel. In uh, chapter two, 
um, talks about truth, knowledge, and faith. I find an uh, you know it's interesting chapter, but I want to ask you the definition of truth because um, it seems that uh, for some uh, two plus two equal five, uh, claiming that the truth is irrele irrelevant. Mm -hmm. What is truth? <clears throat> okay, good. Yeah, uh, Travis Dickinson wrote this chapter. It's a wonderful chapter on knowledge. So what is truth? Truth is basically um, some, something that obtains when you have a belief or a statement or a thought that matches the way the world is, right? So you have a, a, a statement, the moon is made of green cheese, and that statement is false because in fact, in reality, the moon is not made of green cheese. Or we have the statement, the grass is green, and I'm looking outside my office window and there is green grass. So there, that statement matches reality. So that's truth. So truth has to do with propositions, the words, the statements that we, we make. And if they match reality, well, then that's what truth is. So the claim two plus two equals five, I would just say that that is false because it doesn't match reality, right? It's not the case that two plus two equals five. So it's not true. Yeah. That's what it is quickly. That, that's, that's, that's true. <laughs> so <laughs> when we correlate truth to knowledge, okay, how do we know, for instance, that Christianity is true? I mean, we cannot look out of the window to see if it's green or whatever, mm -hmm. but yeah. how do we know what we know is true? Great. Okay, good. So, yes, the truth is a component in knowledge, right? Um, sometimes people, philosophers, analyze knowledge as justified true belief. And so you have to, so it has to be a belief that's true and then rational or justified. So how do we know that Christianity is true? Well, I would say we consider the evidence and there's all these different categories of evidence that you could consider. You could consider um, testimony, which is a valid source of evidence. So for example, you could look at the testimony or the eyewitness accounts that you find in the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the New Testament. And so there'd be a lot of apologetic questions about, is the eyewitness testimony that you read there credible? Is it trustworthy? And if you can establish that, and I think you can, well, then you have good credible evidence from which to have a rational or justified true belief. So you can look at testimony, you can look at, um, there's various arguments for God, and we talk about some of them in the book, but arguments are just ways of formalizing our thoughts, um, you know, and you can really begin with any, any feature of the world. This is kind of my view, that any feature of the world, you can plug it into a premise in an argument as an empirical premise, and you can make an argument that leads to the conclusion that God exists. So you could look at the world and say something like, you know, the universe exists. Uh, that's an empirical premise. You know, the universe began to exist, actually. Um, you know, and then you could add another premise. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. And from that, the universe has a cause. So that's a quick example of the cosmological argument. Um, yeah, so I would look at all the different sources of evidence from sense perception and looking at features of our world to testimony to um, uh, even to the experience of God or the possible experience of God as a kind of uh, evidence for God. Getting to the, the point of faith, Richard uh, Dawkins uh, gives an interesting definition of faith, and he, say, and he states, faith is the great co-op, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is believed in spite of, even perhaps because of the lack of evidence. So what is faith? Does uh, Richard uh, Dawkins' uh, definition make any sense? Because it seems to be an excuse more than a rational mm -hmm. approach to personal belief. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I would not agree with Richard Dawkins' claim that faith is um, something you believe in the absence of evidence. In fact, no Christian or person of faith would agree with that, con that definition of faith. Uh, faith is just ventured trust, is, is I think the best way to summarize it. You know, it's, it's rational, it's reasonable, but it's a kind of trusting in the reasonable object, right? It's a kind of ventured trust. Um, sometimes, you know, philosophers, I'm a philosopher, philosophers like to make distinctions. And so one way to think of faith is to make a distinction between um, belief that and belief in. So I can believe that God exists. So I believe that the proposition God exists is true. 
but I can also have faith in God or trust in God. And that's, that's more what faith is, right? We believe that God exists, and so we place our faith in God. And of course, that belief that God exists is something that we have good reasons, I think, uh, to, to hold as true. And that's why I act, I venture my trust in God, because I have good reasons to think that it exists. So yeah, I would just reject that whole characterization um, that he gives about what faith is. Well, since we talk about uh, Dawkins, uh, he made the following statement of miracles. That's another problem. Mm -hmm. And he says that uh, coincidence, which have a very low probability, but uh, which are nevertheless in the realm of probabilities. So what is a miracle and how can we be sure of it? Can you give us a little bit of a guideline of uh, how can we identify a miracle? Yeah, that's good. What is a miracle? I mean, very, again, just starting very simply, um, we could define that as an act of, of God that, where he intercedes in some way to uh, bring about an effect in the world. So that would be what I would, a very simple definition of a, a miracle is an act of God to bring about an, an effect in this world where he intercedes to bring about an effect. And then in terms of how we test those, you would put them under the same kind of rational scrutiny that you would put any claim to any kind of event. You know, So in fact, for me, I was confronted as a freshman in college with this claim that Jesus uh, Christ claimed to be God and that he proved it by raising from the dead, which would be a miracle by any standard, right? Because dead people don't come back to life according to the laws of nature, right? And so I actually spent my entire freshman year in college trying to refute that by considering the evidence, right? What is the, what is the evidence for the resurrection? Um, you know, what would, what would that, what was the state of the empty tomb? How, wh why was the tomb empty? What, what are the best explanations for that? You know, what, what is the best explanation for these reported appearances of Jesus after he resurrected? You know, are, are these good eyewitness accounts? And so you just would put all these claims to the test um, the same way that you would test any event. Um, and what you would find, at least since I'm talking about the resurrection, what I found was uh, an incredible amount of evidence uh, that it is very reasonable to think that he actually did raise from the dead. I would say that doesn't mean that I, but it, at that same time, at the same time, if someone came up to me today and said a miracle happened, I would be very skeptical, right? Um, I would want to see the evidence for that. And that's, but that's also why I believe Christianity is true, because I've looked at the evidence, and it's very compelling uh, to believe. In uh, chapter eight, uh, the title of the chapter says, Jesus is the only way. So um, why is Jesus the only way to salvation, since many other religions offer different paths, how can it be? How can we be sure of it? Good. Okay. Good. Why is Jesus the only way to salvation? Well, the very simple reason is because he says so in Scripture. So I, I would kind of back it up this way, and I would say, we look at the four biographies of Jesus Christ: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we ask the question: Are these four biographies of Jesus Christ trustworthy for purposes of history? And I think that. In examining the evidence there, we have good reasons to think it's trustworthy for purposes of history. And in there, Jesus Christ says some pretty um, amazing things. The one that actually um, was really compelling to me as a young freshman who did not believe these things was found in John 14, 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And that's a pretty bold claim, right? He's not saying I'm a way a truth or a life, but the way, the truth and the life. In other words, I'm the only way um, to, to reconnect with God. And so I realized even as a non-believer that if that's true, um, well, then he's God. And if it's not true, then I can just reject the whole thing. That's why I tried to reject or explore the resurrection. Yeah. So the biggest reason why we think Jesus is the only way is because he says so. And we think that what he said as recorded in the gospels is trustworthy. You could go, there's other ways to that same conclusion. Um, one other way has to do with the fact that we also, I think, have good historical reasons to think that Jesus is actually God's son. Uh, theologians talk about God incarnate, where he took on this human nature so that he could be like us, and so he would die for us so as an acceptable sacrifice for our sins. And if, in fact, because he did raise from the dead, we have good reasons to think he was, in fact, God incarnate. And there's this argument that you can give that goes something like this, you know, any religion that God founds, I'm sorry, it'd be something like any religion 
where God sent his son is, you know, the religion that God wants us to be connected with. You know, God sent his son uh, through Jesus Christ and founded the Christian religion. Therefore, you know, the Christian faith is the one true faith. So you could kind of give an argument through that as well. Um, and theologians have noted that. And so, for example, John Hick, who was an important theologian, noted that kind of a argument. And so he actually denied this premise that Jesus is God incarnate, because once you get Jesus as God incarnate, it's a very short step to this is the religion that God founded and the one that we need to reconcile God through. So those are a few thoughts. One of the arguments against the existence of God, uh, and you talk about that in the chapter nine, it's the presence of evil and suffering. And it's, an, it's a huge debate going on for so long that there are so many um, um, recordings and about it, but how we respond to those issues, does the presence of evil support the argument ag against his existence? Good. Okay, good. Yeah. <clears throat> I think this is the hardest or the most formidable challenge for the Christian. And it's, it is in fact, the number one argument for atheism. Um, and the idea is that if God exists, he wouldn't allow all this evil or all this seemingly pointless evil, yet there is evil. Therefore it's inconsistent with the reality of a good and powerful God. So it is, it is in fact, the strongest argument um, and maybe the, the intellectual reason why people reject God. But on the same on the other hand, I would say that there that it is not um, inconsistent with Christianity, and I think that arguments can be given and replies can be given that reconcile the um, hor horror and the badness of evil with the goodness of God. And so, even in that chapter, which I did write, um, so I'm a little more familiar with that one. Uh, you know, I go through some of the standard arguments to show that there's no logical incompatibility between the existence of a good and powerful God and evil. And then really where the debate is for in the academic world, but really just in the normal people world too, the debate is um, over this premise, well, if God exists, there wouldn't be any pointless evil, but we just see all this evil that's pointless. Um, therefore, God probably doesn't exist. That's called the evidential argument for God. And um, I think that there's really good reasons coming from faith and philosophy from scripture and philosophy to reject the premise that there is pointless evil. And so, so theists have been giving reasons why God allows evil for ages. And I canvas some of those, the ones that are more compelling have to do with God's desire that we would be free creatures, that we would have, that we would be self-determiners of our character and our actions and our lives. And to have that kind of significant freedom, well, God permits and knows that we'll misuse it. And when we misuse it, bad things happen, evil happens. Yet God values that freedom, partly because this is the same freedom that it enables us to have meaningful relationships with God and meaningful relationships with others. And so he permits it. So I think something like it's called the free will defense or the free will theodicy. Um, something like that is going to be part of the overall case for reconciling um, the existence of God with the ex existence of evil. So yeah, I don't think it um, ultimately in showing that God doesn't. Yeah, it's true. I mean, the fact that uh, uh, the existence of something doesn't mean that uh, that something else would not exist. I mean, it's a fallacy on this kind of thinking. Um, apologetics, and we were talking about earlier that you know, apologetics, it's a, a branch of theology. And uh, uh, in my uh, discussion with uh, Dr. David Hortman, uh, he was saying that we, was, we, were, we agreed that both uh, the evangelist, an evangelist and an apologetics, they kind of do kind of the same job or aim to the same thing. And uh, apologetics is a pre-evangelistic uh, event. And uh, in, in your book, you talk, you talk about uh, a little bit about uh, uh, Christian and uh, the, the fact that uh, we need to stand firm and going on. So the, what I want to ask you, you know, what will help for any Christians, any Christian, regardless what it is, and for instance, right now with Ukraine, that all this stuff, it's a great opportunity for all the Christians to, to, to show the Christ and, and uh, the love of God. But what will help to stand firm and to, to preach the gospel, the good news? Hmm. What, what you suggest that will be a helpful tool to do that? Good. Um, yeah, I mean, 
I think being convinced in our heart and in our minds that Jesus um, is both true and satisfying. Jesus and the gospel are true and satisfying, that it satisfies every longing of the heart. And so that the most important thing we can do is locate our life in the story of God. That would be the first thing I would want to say as Christians, that, that we find our identity, we find our purpose, we find our meaning, we find those good works that God has created us to do when we locate our lives in the story of God that is the gospel story as articulated in scripture. The second thing, though, the reason why I was pausing, I was thinking about the last part of your question, how do we stand firm? And I have a real concern. Um, I have a lot of concerns, but one of them is the rampant anti-intellectualism in the church. Um, and so I would just encourage you to reject that. As you look in scripture, we are called to love God with all of our mind, as J.P. Moreland, I'm sure, discussed when he was on here with you. Um, and, you know, in scripture, anti-intellectualism is a sin. It's, it's, it's a scandal. Um, we are called to love God with all of our being. And so I would just say we've got to begin to develop a robust theology of beauty, of the mind, of the body, of, you know, apologetics, all, all of these things, because culture, as you know, I mean, right now we're sitting here and we're watching the news and, and the horror that's unfolding in Ukraine. But there's evil, there's war, there's gender wars, there's, you know, all these things that we just have to be prepared to be engaged in these battles that are taking place um, against the church. And so, yeah, just love God with all of your being. And that, of course, includes your mind. There's more that I would want to say, but if we could just locate our life in the great story of God and begin to love God with their minds, I think I would be happy, um, at least in the right direction. How's that? How's that? So this is the book that I'm uh, talking about and I'm suggesting, you know, for uh, uh, any of uh, who is listening to us to buy it and read it. Hopefully in someday, you know, we'll be able to translate in Romanian. Uh, what's the future for you? What's uh, what you got to do? I mean, you have any plans uh, writing more books? I mean, you wrote so many. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. it was a difficult uh, for me to 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 choose from Amazon which one to 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 kind of talk about it, and I chose this one because it, it is it's important for today to stand to stand firm That's in right. our belief. So, uh, what's the future for you? Why you start? What are you writing? What you what you gotta it's good. work on it? Okay, yeah, good. No, I do have a book coming out actually this November. Um, it's called um, A Good and True Story. And it's an attempt to blend reason and the imagination in making the case in the gospel. And so I basically take the reader through, it's kind of a journey, but take the reader through 11 features of our world, talked about earlier, that I think point to the divine. And so we look at the universe, we look at life itself, we look at species, the question of the origin of species, and we look at the question of humans. And then we have chapters, I have chapters on meaning, morality. Uh, happiness, pain, problem of evil, beauty, love, and then religion. And we kind of look at each feature phenomena of the world and ask, what does this reveal about the true story of the world? And so that's kind of the goal. Um, so it's written for non-believers. It's written for people that don't believe, but they want to know truth, right? And so that's kind of what I'm doing. So that's coming out in November. It's called A Good and True Story. Um, and then other than that, I have books that I need to write that are under contract on, but I don't have the time right now, on philosophical theology, um, and some other projects related to philosophy and more technical work. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, those are the things I'm working on. And then just teaching here at Palm Beach Atlantic, uh, teaching graduate level philosophy to students. Would you present also your institute? Because I'm fascinated. I find out today, I, you know, I'm trying to do a little bit more about you. And I, uh, and I find about an institute and I, I, I listen to the, I'm, I'm looking to the video and, and your team, and I was quite impressed about it. Can you present us a little bit, you know, for our yeah. audience uh, uh, about your institute? Sure. Yeah. So um, it, it's kind of a side thing, but it's an opportunity to be more, a little more creative than my day job as a professor. Um, I, I founded a, and grabbed some friends that were like-minded and we founded something called the Two Tasks Institute. The Two Tasks are showing Christianity reasonable and showing Christianity desirable. And there we kind of explore those questions. What does it mean to flourish in a disenchanted world? So there's a podcast called the Udo podcast. I'm, we're currently, actually, after I get off with you, we're starting to record uh, um, season six, which will be on C.S. Lewis's science fiction trilogy. Uh, but we've got uh, videos on, you know, different issues related to culture and the gospel. And it's just an opportunity to think through these questions. What does it look like? What is faithfulness to Christ? 
How do we stand firm in our culture uh, in a way that's winsome and attractive yet robust uh, for the gospel? So that's what that is. The twotestinstitute.org is where you can find that. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, take more to it because you are a busy man and I'm so appreciative for what you're doing for us and especially for a Romanian audience. Uh, God bless you. And uh, hopefully we'll see you soon on the conference. Yes. Blessings to you. Thank you for your time. It's great to be with you, Octavian, as well. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.